we're still figuring out how filtration really works. Um, and we're getting closer to understanding what's going on, but there's still, there's still work ahead for us, um, which is what's exciting about this, right? The fact that we don't yet know everything means that there's still opportunities and it means that there's, there's still distinct possibilities that we'll be able to make significant improvements in how well plants perform or alternately in how cheaply we can build them once we have an understanding of the physics and can optimize our design for that. Um, so more learning ahead. So today we're gonna start on uh, just more, more about what's going on inside filters and how they're designed and what, what the different options are, a little bit of, even a little bit of um, the broader context of what kind of filters are available. So let's do it. So I can't help myself, I have to talk a little bit about slow sand filters. Um, we, will, we will skim over the idea of the roughing filters and dynamic gravel filters, but we will talk about rapid sand and ultimately about stack rapid sand, which is where we're really going. Um, so that's what's coming up. So a little bit about types of filters. So it is very, very common. Um, well, first of all, most municipal water treatment plants in the United States use rapid sand filters. They are depth filters. That's the, the second bullet in this list. There are also many plants that are beginning to use membrane filters. That's a transition that's been happening for the last few decades. Um, and membrane filters have pores in this like plastic membrane and the pores are so tiny that they can capture all the particles that you would wanna remove from the water. So the pores are smaller than, than bacteria, for example, and so they will absolutely capture those bacteria. Um, and so you might be wondering, well, goodness, in that case, that sounds like an awesome filter. Why don't we just all switch to membranes? Um, and the reason that we don't all switch to membranes is they're still fairly expensive. They don't have a very long life and they require lots of chemicals in order to keep them clean. So they, they can't just be cleaned with a backwash, like we'll talk about later for sand filters. And so cleaning of them requires use of a mix of an array of chemicals. And so it's messy. Um, the other filter, now we're getting to the very, very top of the first note here. The other filter that is like surface filtration where particles are captured right when they're trying to enter the filter um, is slow sand filters. Slow sand are the first kind of filters that were um, created and they have smaller sand media and they have low, much, much lower filtration rates. And they also tend to capture almost all the particles right at the surface. Um, we're gonna eventually get to depth filtration because that's where we, that's where we think the, the best option is. Um, a little history on slow sand. Um, no one started out, you did, if you just have one kind of filter, you don't call it slow sand, you just call it a filter, right? And then um, eventually um, we tried to use those filters that were invented in, in England. We tried to use them here in the United States and there are some of these filters that are built and are still operating in the United States. Um, but eventually those filters ran into really big difficulties when, we, when they tried to apply them to rivers like the Ohio River or to the Mississippi because the, the clay content of that water was high enough that these filters would clog really, really fast. And so it just wasn't practical to use them. Um, and so in the United States, someone invented what they called a mechanical filter. And it, it was mechanical in the sense that it could be backwashed using hydraulic, so the water could be reversed to go up through the sand and that way it could be cleaned. And so that's why they called it mechanical. Um, and that led to this little race between the United Kingdom, England, and, and the United States. And we started calling the filters that were invented here 
American filters, and we called what they had invented the English filters. And then eventually we realized that maybe we shouldn't um, call them by which country invented them, but we should give them a name related to a characteristic of those filters. And so the big difference is the velocity of the water going through these filters. And so they've been called the slow sand and rapid sand since then. Um, and there's also a, a thread of uh, some, some folks who now call slow sand filters biosand. Um, and I find that um, amusing and disappointing because uh, that assumes that the, that the reason that slow sand filters work is because of um, microbiological activity. And I did my entire dissertation on that topic and showed that actually um, the filters have a very, very strong physical chemical action. And it turns out, this is a complete surprise. Guess what makes slow sand filters work? Oh, let's go to rapid sand filters first. Rapid sand filters only work if there's a coagulant that has been added to the water so that the particles that are in the, in the water are sticky. Same reason that flocculation works. So you need to have sticky particles in order for rapid sand filters to work. And now is the surprise. It turns out that there's a particular chemical that is really, really important to make slow sand filters work also, and I demonstrated that there is naturally occurring aluminum in at least some waters, and that is clearly associated with slow sand filters working well. So slow sand filters work because of the fact that there's aluminum in the water that makes just naturally occurring particles sticky already, a little bit sticky, um, but not sticky enough to make flocculation work, but sticky enough to make the filter work. Um, so, okay, so we, we talked about slow and rapid and then in 2010, stacked rapid sand filters were invented by the Our Clutter program. And they are smaller, they're more compact than rapid sand filters, and they are self backwashing, so they don't require any pumps. So let's talk some more about filters. First of all, um, I think we talked about this early on, that if, if you talk to someone on the street and you say, I've got some dirty water, it looks cloudy, and I want to do something to it so that I can drink it, what should I do to it? Almost everyone would respond, you should filter it, right? And I, I want you to make sure you all leave this course saying, wait, if it's so dirty that you can see that it's dirty, then it's too dirty for filters to work. Unless you're using like a Sawyer filter or a camping filter and you're not planning on getting much water through it. But if you're actually work, working on treating water for a municipality and you've got to process a lot of water, then a filter is not going to be economical if you're trying to remove that much dirt with a filter. And so what we find instead is that each of these filtration systems can handle a little bit of turbidity, like maybe slow sand filters max out at around 10. And I suspect that they actually struggle if they were given 10 NTU water. Rapid sand filters are somewhere around three or four NTU. And above that, they're gonna, they're gonna struggle. Um, a STARS filter, I would put at two or three NTU. And, and in any case, both rapid sand and STARS filters would be really, really happy if the turbidity was under one. So, and that's, isn't that interesting? Like one NTU means that the water is so clear that you wouldn't see anything with your eyes. And yet that's when these filters are actually happiest. Um, but in all cases, um, we can extend the range of these filters by adding additional treatment processes. So for slow sand filters, there's this idea of multiple stage filtration where they add gravel filters upstream from the slow sand filter and that gravel removes some of the particles. Um, in the case of rapid sand filters, you're gonna add flocculation and sedimentation upstream. And in the case of 
a stars filter. I need to update these graphics. We're going to add, um, we're going to add flocculation, and we're going to add flock filters, and we're going to add plate sellers upstream. So, in in all of these cases, filter performance is going to really vary depending on how clean the water is coming out of these what it's called pretreatment steps. We're going to remember what filters are good for. They're good for polishing water that is already pretty clean. Um, and, and here's part of why we really want to have our particles removed by the, the clarifier and not by the filter. And it's because the, the concentration of the solids that are exiting the filter during backwash is actually not very high. It's just a few hundred turbidity units. Whereas the concentration of solids coming out of the, out of the flock hopper can be thousands of NTUs. And maybe this isn't so immediately apparent, but your goal at the water treatment plant is to make as much clean water as you can. Your goal is to minimize how much waste you produce. And since you have to waste water that has the solids in it, you want to waste this, you want the solids concentration in the wastewater to be as high as possible so that more of that water can be sent to your customers as clean water. So that means you would like all of your particles to be wasted from the process that produces the highest concentration of solids. And the highest concentration of solids is from the clarifier. And that then goes to another little insight. You can take the backwash water that's gonna come from cleaning the filters and you can send that, you can save it and then pump it back up to the front end of the plant and send it through the plant again. And now you treat it again. And now those particles have another opportunity to come out in the sedimentation tank or in the, in the clarifier. Um, and we're not violating conservation of mass. Those solids still have a place to come out, but we're, we're forcing all of the solids to leave via the clarifier, the flock hopper, rather than leaving, letting any of them leave as backwash water. And given that, in most communities, there are at least some times during the year when there is not as much water as they really need. That means that water conservation is super important. And one of the first steps to conserve water is to not dump the backwash water. So Agua Clara has not yet done this. We have several plants, well, all of our plants just dump the backwash water. Um, and I, we are incorporating backwash recycle into the designs that we are creating now because we think it's important that all future plants should have that.